My mom, she'll come on set and she'll be like, how do you know how to direct? Mm. Like, where did you learn that? And I'm like, well, what part of directing are you referring to? The technical yeah. part, the communicating with actors, the, you know, edit, the storytelling. There's so many elements. And so it can be really intimidating. Mm -hmm. I'm very much somebody who has to feel out the process. You've probably heard of Lulu Wong from her 2019 hit, The Farewell. That movie is about a young Chinese-American woman who travels to China to visit her ailing grandmother as part of a family-wide scheme to say goodbye to the matriarch without letting her know she's dying. That film premiered at Sundance, won Best Feature at the Independent Spirit Awards, and was named one of the American Film Institute's Top 10 Best Films of 2019. And along the way, Wong helped to usher in a new era of Asian-American filmmaking in Hollywood. Now, Wong is back with a new series, Expats, an adaptation of Janice Y.K. Lee's best-selling novel, The Expatriates. Nicole Kidman stars in the six-part series, which follows a group of American women living in Hong Kong whose lives are united by sudden tragedy. The series traces their shifting relationships as they navigate blame, accountability, and what it means to be a mother in an increasingly globalized world. I'm not going to say much more than that because... Spoilers, but I saw a few of the early episodes, and let me tell you, I am shook. In our conversation, Lulu Wong explains her unique approach to filmmaking, relives the challenges of being an assistant in Hollywood, and tells us why she felt it was so important to make a show about expats living in Hong Kong. I'm Charlotte Alter, senior correspondent for Time, and this is Person of the Week. So tell us about your mom. I understand that she had a sort of creative background as well, and she was a cultural critic and editor for the Beijing Literary Gazette. What were the conversations with her like as you sort of decided to embark on a career in the arts? Yeah, my mom was, I would say, more encouraging than other Chinese immigrant friends of hers that I knew of because— she and my dad both come from arts and social sciences, and so she always read philosophy to me mm. even as a little kid, and she had me play the piano. She encouraged me to take art classes. So in many ways, she was very encouraging of having an arts education, but at the same time, because she knew that it was not a very stable career, that there were no guarantees, there was a lot of fear and so, yeah, we fought a lot about it because I would say things like, well, why are you having me learn piano if you don't actually want me to pursue a career in the arts? Why am I taking all of these art lessons just so I can, like, go to some school and get a job as a lawyer or a, a, a business person? And she didn't always have the answer for that. She said, well, no matter what you do, it's good to have this well-rounded education and just to be somebody who has a wide foundation for whatever you do in life. And we never talked so much about happiness. It wasn't about, like, what makes you happy? What are you interested in? There was a lot more conversation around what you should be. As a daughter of two people who were really accomplished and as two intellectuals, um, and, you know, obviously there was their whole history in China with the Cultural Revolution and with certain restrictions on who they could be there. Mm. And so they didn't want me to face those restrictions. And yet at the same time, because they were immigrants, I faced other restrictions that were more self-imposed, I think. You know, there were a lot of fears around if they couldn't see the path, how was I ever going to take that path? And so I think they were prescribing paths that they knew better. Hmm. So can you remember the moment when you knew you wanted to be a filmmaker, where you were like, hell yes, this is what I want to do? Yeah, I think, you know, the first semester of my senior year is when I took Film 101, and then I took an advanced filmmaking class uh, the next semester and ended up making a bunch more short films. And then they had this small student film awards at... Boston College. 
And it was really encouraging because I think having that validation helped me to recognize that it was something that I was good at and that I could potentially pursue. And it also helped to convince my parents, not that they were convinced because I had gotten into law school on a full scholarship and my parents were just horrified when I said, (laughs) I'm not going, I'm going to defer and I'm going to work in a coffee shop while I figure out how to become a filmmaker. And so then I understand you sort of started off as an assistant on movies like Superbad and Pineapple Express. What did you learn or not learn from being an assistant? I learned that the industry is very hierarchical. And I also learned mostly through David Gordon Green, who directed Pineapple Express, who had come from the indie world, that you could make that crossover, Mm -hmm. which was really great to see. But the thing I didn't learn was how I was going to get there, how I was going to create work that would create a platform that would allow me to make indie films or transition. You know, there's no formula to getting to that first step even. So I have to tell you, I was also an assistant in Hollywood. Um, I got fired. (laughs) Yay! It's a badge of honor. You know what? Thank you. (laughs) I also uh, think of it that way as well. Um, But I have to ask you, and you don't have to say any names, but what is the worst thing you were ever asked to do as an assistant? And then I'll tell you mine. Okay. This one, because it was quite traumatic, I was asked to get a very specific salad from the deli of Whole Foods. And I had to check like five Whole Foods at close to 10 o'clock at night because they didn't have the one with the cranberries. And the last one I got to, they were closing and I was crying and I was like, I can't get fired. Like, please, like, just let me in. Oh my God. And I ran in <laughs> and I got it. And, and yet it didn't even feel that good because there was just something kind of I think, humiliating about, like, good job. You got the – I was like, I'm made for more than this. (laughs) Yeah. So one time my boss, she was flying from L.A. to New York for an art opening. And she had a coat, but there was a different coat that she wanted to wear that she forgot, and it wasn't going to ship in time. So I flew it on a red eye across the country on my lap. Wow. Yeah. So shortly after moving to L.A., you started this company called Legal Real, which shot videos – for plaintiffs' attorneys. Um, You know, why did you take this sort of unorthodox approach to getting into the film world? You know, at the time, it was really just a practicality for paying the bills. Mm -hmm. I didn't think of it necessarily as a path to becoming a filmmaker. I just realized, okay, this is a skill that I have, and there's an industry for this. Because I had a friend who was a lawyer, and he showed me a video that he had hired a company to do. And I thought, wait, how much did you pay this person? Um, It was a pretty simple documentary setup. And I realized that, okay, this is an opportunity for me to apply my skills. So I started doing them for him, and After I made a few and I had samples, and when I moved to L.A., I just would start showing up at random lawyer events that I wasn't invited to Mm -hmm. and try to pitch myself. So what did you learn from doing that? I learned a lot about empathy. Um, I learned a lot about how to talk to people to get them to open up, um, how to make them comfortable. Because for the most part, I was crafting a narrative to help tell somebody's story where they felt otherwise unheard or Mm. they felt like a jury was never going to understand. Because when you are in mediation or you're in trial and you're up on a stand, how do you explain a traumatic brain injury where you look and sound normal? But you know that when you get up in the morning and you take the eggs out and you turn around, you forget if you've just taken the eggs out or not. So... It just taught me to be really, really open. Hmm. So you first got your break as a director with your first feature film in 2014, which was called Posthumous. Um, And you've said 
sense that this film didn't really go anywhere. But what did you learn from that experience? I mean, I learned that I could make a film. <laughs> yeah. I had a lot of self-doubt. And then by the end of it, I just felt like, okay, like, I know how to do this. So I think, like, all of it just gave me the confidence to know that I could do it. But it left me really thinking about, okay, now that I know how to do it, what is it that I want to hmm. actually say? What are the stories that I should be telling? Yeah. So that brings me to The Farewell, which was this huge breakout hit of 2019. And for listeners who haven't seen it, it's about a young woman who travels back to China to see her grandmother who is dying, but the whole family knows she's dying, and they've all agreed to not tell her, and instead they kind of stage this sort of sham wedding in order to all spend time with her before she dies, even though they don't tell her that she's dying. So I understand that the farewell is based on some real life experiences that you had. Can you tell us a little bit about the journey that that story took? Yeah, um, it is based on my real life experiences. This actually happened to me in some form or another. I took some creative license, but yeah. when it happened, I immediately knew that it was a story. And not just because it was about me. It wasn't just, for, okay, like, this is an opportunity for me to be autobiographical in my filmmaking. It wasn't that. I just thought, what a dilemma, you know? There's so much tension here, but there's also so much humor. There's an absurdity to the situation. And it, knowing that I wanted to make it into art helped me to deal with it in the moment because mm. I had so much frustration where I felt like no one understood me, I wasn't being heard, and I felt like I just didn't know what was up or down, what was right or wrong. Right. And so knowing that I was going to grapple with those questions through a film eventually really helped me to process and to just be present in the moment instead of just being grief-stricken also. And so when I started pitching the film, people didn't understand. I think everyone just felt like, is this a movie for China? Mm -hmm. And it wasn't. You know, I didn't see it that way. And yet, you know, because of it being mostly shot in China and predominantly in the Chinese language, and also it's a film about a Chinese grandmother, most producers didn't feel like it was for the marketplace. Hmm. So it went nowhere when I was pitching it. And I sort of set it aside. And eventually it became a This American Life episode. And then as soon as the episode aired, we started getting calls from production companies. Hmm. And so one of the things that I loved about this film was the way it kind of asked real questions about um, the difference between American and Chinese values when it comes to things like family and community. And Billy comes into this situation thinking her grandmother really has a right to know. And then the rest of her family says, essentially, like, this is bigger than one person. This is about our entire family and our entire community. And so we act sort of as one. I'm curious if you can tell us a little bit more about what you were trying to explore in terms of the differences between Chinese and American culture. Yeah, I mean, I think it's not even just like Chinese and American. I think that there's something about old world, new world hmm. as well. And just this theme that runs through all of my work around collectivism versus individualism. And I think that it's easy to think of it as a binary, that Americans are all about individualism. I mean, which we are. I think that is like a prominent value. And Eastern cultures often emphasize collectivism. But I think ultimately that the answer lies somewhere in between, somewhere on that spectrum. For everybody, it's going to be a little bit different. And so I just wanted to look at all of the different facets of this polarity without any kind of judgment hmm. and without saying this is right, this is wrong, but just seeing how it, 
is done differently in different places, and the considerations are different. So in the past few years, there have been movies and shows like The Farewell, Crazy Rich Asians, Everything Everywhere All at Once, Beef, which just won several big awards, which are huge critical and commercial successes, and they tell Asian American stories. I'm curious if you think the tide is shifting for Asian American representation in Hollywood at all. Yeah, I definitely do think that there is a shift in that there's a lot more facets to the Asian American story, that Mm -hmm. it's not just an immigrant story. It's not always an outsider story. It can just be about people. And their identity happens to be part of who they are, but it doesn't define the entire story, right? And I think that's really exciting that we get to see more perspectives. But I think that it's not enough. I think that the challenges people in the community still face that we talk about privately are still not necessarily the best conditions to do the best work. I think Hmm. we still face a lot of people's biases of what it should be based on who you are and where you're from, what their version of an ethnic story might be, being pigeonholed. I think that a lot of those struggles are still the same, even though there are more doors that are open. When we come back, Lulu Wong talks about directing her new series, Expats. More in a minute. So how did you come to expats after the farewell? What brought you to this project and what kind of story did you want to tell next? You know, honestly, I really wanted to tell a story about diaspora. Hmm. And this just felt like when I read Janice Y.K. Lee's novel, which Nicole Kidman brought to me, I felt so compelled by how nuanced and layered all of the female characters were. And the way that these women are all so different, and yet they intersected this moment in this place in time. Mm -hmm. And that's what I just felt like was really meaty that I could get into because there's so much joy for me when I see people who on paper shouldn't like each other. But in life, you put them together and you share a meal and you have these conversations. Like for this show, I could have Nicole Kidman be in the same world as these domestic workers from overseas, in the same world with local Hong Kongers who are facing their own epic struggles within Mm -hmm. the city, with a Korean-American New Yorker who was in Hong Kong and who was constantly confused as being a local, even though she barely even speaks Korean, much less Cantonese, right? right? And so I just thought, like, all of these blurred lines was really interesting. Hmm. So you would mentioned that you were approached by Nicole Kidman to Mm -hmm. adapt this. What were some of those early conversations like? Well, the first conversation I had passed, and she was calling me, and I was like, oh, man. Uh, Like, I... (laughs) What's it like to get bugged by Nicole Kidman? (laughs) Well, I mean, it's an honor. But also, I was like, she's going to try to convince me, isn't she? Yeah. But we just had a conversation where she was like, well, why don't you think you could do it? What are the conditions in which you would do Mm -hmm. it since I know that you love the book? So we just talked about that where I said, I feel like the story that I want to tell from this book and – the kind of creative freedom that I would need to be able to tell this story might be too big of an uphill battle. I think we both saw the story as being about home and family and motherhood and women's relationship to motherhood and grief. But I'm also from China and 
knew that I also wanted to look at the context of the expat bubble within a greater world. And I wanted to be able to be in a, this bubble, but not celebrate it. Hmm. And I think that my fear was that there was a desire to want to celebrate it because it is a very aspirational world and everyone loves to see rich people and their shenanigans. And so I was also struggling with how do I do that? How do I tell a story about privilege and make sure that I'm not judging it, but I'm also not celebrating it? Yeah. And it's just a very fine line to balance. I knew that the series was not going to be driven by this, like, classic engine, like, of a whodunit, mm -hmm. right? That was not what I was drawn to. And my engine was more, how do we cope? Yeah. How do any of us cope with anything? Right. Well, so you just mentioned that this story, it is very political. It deals with Domestic politics, class politics, national politics, even though it's not overtly political at all, it is very much about how all of these different experiences kind of intersect in this one tragedy that befalls this family. How did you consider the intersections of the political and the personal when you were making this world? Well, um, I did think a lot about privilege and who gets to be silent, hmm. you know? And so it's easy to say, oh, I'm not political, when it doesn't affect you, when your actual silence is a political statement, Yeah, right? And I think for me, that's what it was. Like, I couldn't do a series in Hong Kong as a Chinese-American immigrant and not reference the actual history of what is going on and what has gone on there, that silence would be political. And so I had to navigate that. And so, you know, yeah, that was also one of the things that terrified me, how to do that in a way that still focused on these characters against mm -hmm. the backdrop, you know, and I thought a lot about Hong Kong as a character and the journey of the city as a parallel to the journey of the women in hmm. the story. You know, the sense of resilience, this yeah. question of do you fight or do you endure? Mm -hmm. You know, and th those are both forms of resilience, both fighting and enduring. And for my family, who has done both in different situations, I think that's a question that these characters ask, and it's a question that I think many Hong Kongers have mm -hmm. asked, and particularly around this question of home. Do you yeah. fight or do you endure? And I also think, and without saying too much, I think that this series deals really interestingly with the question of care work mm -hmm. and the ways in which domestic labor, which we think of as something as intimate as who's cleaning up after you and your home or who's helping you raise your children, actually are part of the global economy mm -hmm. and are extremely globalized and extremely politicized. Mm -hmm. um, was that something that you were thinking about as you were making this? Were you thinking about trying to say something or ask questions about the nature of care work when it comes to motherhood? Absolutely. I think that caretaking is something that just isn't seen on screen, you know? Mm -hmm. And I think that there's real danger in that invisibility of, like, who's actually doing the labor and what it costs, what it takes. And I think a main part of why Westerners love being expats in a place particularly like Hong Kong is that they get a lot of support, mm -hmm. and which is wonderful. And it's something I think about all the time, right? Again, you, there's a collective, um, whether that's family, but also that there is this system in place of domestic workers and live-in help. And, you know, it's something that I heard a lot, too, while I was doing research of people saying, oh, well, you know, the values are different here. Mm. And... It's like, well, are your values different? Or right. is it just easier for you to shift your values because you're in a society that accepts them and has um, a different perspective? Mm. 
And so in a way, it's like you get away with things maybe that you wouldn't hear. And there's always the comparison, well, the locals are so much worse. You should see how, you know, we're actually doing great. And it's like, well, is that how you judge? Can you give me an example? Um, oh, just in terms of, like, the size of the room that you're giving hmm. the person um, who's living with you and who's working full time for you and your family. When you go look at homes in Hong Kong, whether it's an apartment or a single house, they all have like a helper's area. Hmm. There's a built-in space in the architecture of these places right. for live-in help. And they tend to be in the basement. They tend to go off of the kitchen. They are always separated from the family, huh. so as, as far away as possible. And we saw places that had the helper's bed above the pantry. You know, like literally it was a shelf that pulls out. Wow. And so what do you do with that, right? But again, you know, I didn't come from a place where I was trying to attach a judgment. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to show what it was and to leave these questions for audiences to answer for themselves. Yeah. So... One thing that really struck me is this show feels very different from The Farewell. The mm. Farewell felt like an indie drama. This is a suspense show. There is a real, I mean, I felt psychological horror watching it because of the tragedy at the core of the show. And it is really, really suspenseful. Is there one particular inspiration that you felt like really helped you achieve that? Yeah, I mean, one of the shows that we referenced a lot, particularly the pilot, is this um, French series called Le Revenant, The mm. Returned. And it's just incredible because it deals with the return of the dead. And yet, it's done in a way that's incredibly suspenseful, but it focuses on characters rather than on gore or the mm. horror elements. And it's in many ways like this kind of quiet drama because mm. the driving factor for why I made the series is it's a exploration and hopefully an expansion of empathy mm. because – we all like to think that we have empathy and that we have the capacity for empathy. And yet we're also living in this moment where I think the real battle between light versus dark is this battle for consciousness. So I think that with this show, I really wanted to challenge people to think for themselves what their capacity for empathy is because in one moment you're going to love somebody in the show, a character. And mm -hmm. then in the next moment, they might do something where you really despise them. And then that'll flip. And that was very intentional because I want to challenge people to realize that we don't know everything about people. Mm -hmm. and we're always making judgments based on one thing that we see. I hope it takes people on a journey to, um, in the end, just expand their ability to have compassion for all people. Well, Lulu, I feel like I've learned so much from talking to you about your career and, you know, what's gone into all this incredible work you've made. But now we want to learn a little bit more about you with a segment that we like to call The Last Time. So just say the first thing that comes to your mind. Um, when's the last time you ate a meal with your family? Yesterday. What did you have? Oh, uh, well, no, not yesterday. It was the day before yesterday. And I... My brother cooked. He came over and he made chicken stir fry, like something homey. Delicious. When's the last time you saw a movie in a theater? A um, couple weeks ago, Zone of Interest. I've heard that's really good. I really mm -hmm. want to see that. When's the last time you took a road trip? Um, last weekend. Where'd you go? We went to Carmel. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah. Wow. When's the last time you taught your dog a new trick? It's been a while, but, but he knows most of them. That's why. So Because he's advanced. He's pretty advanced because he's in the show. Right. Um, and so he had an animal trainer. 
Is he the little white dog in the show? No, he's not the little white dog. He's Nicole Kidman's dog, the one that comes late in episode oh, three. Oh, okay. He, his name is Chauncey, and he plays a dog named Chauncey. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Easter egg. This has been such a fascinating conversation. So <laughs> thank you for making yeah. time to talk with us. Thank you. Lulu Wong's new limited series, Expats, premieres on Prime Video January 26th. Thank you so much for listening to Person of the Week. If you like what you heard, please don't forget to subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And we'd really love to hear from you. So send your tips and thoughts on our show to personoftheweek at time.com. I'm Charlotte Alter. See you next week. Person of the Week is hosted by Charlotte Alter. It's produced by Nina Bisbano and India Witkin. Our senior producer is Ursula Summer. Our story editor is Katie Feather. This episode was mixed by Cedric Wilson. Our theme music was composed by Billy Libby. Joseph Frischmuth is our fact checker. Person of the Week is a co-production of Time Studios and Sugar 23. At Time, our executive producers are Dave O'Connor, Michael Erlinger, and Sam Jacobs. At Sugar 23, our executive producers are Mike Mayer, Michael Sugar, and Liam Billingham. Sasha Mathias is the head of audio at Time. You can find us online at time.com slash person of the week and wherever you get your podcasts. Podcasts.